We're starting in Sukhasana today. That's a seated position, as you probably know. Possibly sitting on a block or two. If you're on two blocks, it's definitely a blanket, always a blanket under the shin uh, for good reasons. On the shrine today, we have Green Tara, who I think represents yoga very, very well. And she represents action from the heart center. Draw the butter push out and back, hands resting on your legs. A bit of lighting adjustment was happening there. <laughs> Attention into the heart center. Breathing through your nose if you can. Drop the shoulders. Lift the chest. Keep a softness to the inner groins, to the hips, the buttocks. That is connected to movement and breath. Movements might include small circular movements or movements side to side. Bring the hands to the heart center, prayer position. We'll chant Om affirming yes to the goddess represented here by Tara, which is the field of interdependence which liberates us. In Buddhism, it's called Praticca Samudvada. Take a deep breath in for Om. Om. And then another deep breath. And let a few deep breaths just roll through you. Jaw soft, eyes soft, throat soft, brain soft, tongue soft. That breath just rolling through, rolling through. Interlace your fingers. Breath still rolling through. Stretch your arms diagonally down and raise the arms up. As the arms raise up, make sure not to impinge on your uh, descending fibers of the trapezius. So how do we avoid impingement? Impingement <clears throat> is a sort of, well, it's an opposition. It's two forces in opposition. Uh, the way to avoid impingement is to give and to allow time for giving. For giving again to the field of interdependence means not getting caught up in particularity. So particularity means, you know, a particular thought or a view or an opinion or a, a sensation, locking it down via concepts, but instead letting things flow, including the breath, including the neck, including the jaw. Take a big wide circle to release, palms up, deep breath, in and of course out, and then another and another and another. Shoulders down, eyes soft. And change the cross of your legs when you feel ready. So very simple start. I've even heard people call this <coughs> simple cross-legged. Right? Don't forget there's a gap between the legs and pelvis. Oh. And we're just sitting in simple cross-legged. So can be on a block, can be on the floor. How are you? Nice to see you. Well done, my dear. <laughs> and so when you're in simple cross legs, you can move left or right. And again, we're just going to loosen our bodies off, it's partic uh, particularly kind of some of those small muscles that tighten up, like around the tailbone, around the back of the pelvis, uh, around the back, multifidus, and so on, these back muscles very small back muscles that run all the way up the back. And the neck as well, of course, which uh, softens because the 
head is upright and tall and buoyant. And the most important thing is our breath. That it's expressive, that it's natural, that it's indicative of the fact that we're uh, relaxing into uh, her power, uh, the goddess, the field. So, you know, yogis traditionally uh, didn't have all these uh, different asanas, but commonly in, in Hatha Yoga texts, one posture was taken, sometimes two, but nearly always just one, and often in many uh, Hatha texts, one is only listed, or sometimes two, then you get in the, in the middle period of Hatha texts, you get 15 listed, but not many. Out of those uh, 15, I think it's eight that are seated. So the point is, you know, great yogis have gone into yoga uh, via one pose. And we should be clear that what yoga as a word refers to is something you enter into. Occasionally it means something you do, but much more usually in text it means something you enter into. We know the word means union. So we enter into this uh, union where breath is the same as body, it's responding as the body is, the mind is the same as breath, and body, brain, breath, and universe are one. There's nothing that's independent in it. And that lack of independence stops us clinging. When we stop clinging, we stop uh, our neurosis is uh, less of a problem. <laughs> and we fall into our true nature, patana. It means to fall, but it also means to fly. Inhale to lift softly. Exhale, right hand on the floor behind you, left hand crosses over both legs. Uh, Aparagraha is a, a pointer to the experience of yoga. Paragraha means not really grasping. <laughs> so let's have our palm facing in at first, even if you normally do this palm facing out, and then counter the closure of the chest that it facilitates by opening the other side of the chest more. And breathe through your nose. Let's close that uh, side of the chest, the front side of the chest, again, by bringing the hand a little bit towards the pelvis, and then Compensate for that again by opening the back side of the collarbones, where your back arm is on the floor. So you still feel broad across the collarbones. And then that final broadening comes from that initial front arm that's on your leg as you roll it back out and then mirror that with the back arm focused on the collarbone area and the breath. We call it broadness, softness, openness of the collarbone area and the spontaneity of the breath. Release and turn back to center, palms up, Gnana Mudra, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, deep breaths, soft, uh, indicative of trust. Trust is not trust in a political party or a social group or a particular person, but in the whole, in the field. Inhale, lift up. Exhale, turn <laughs> the other, other way, other direction. Empty of grasping, palm facing in, which closes the chest a bit. So uh, again, we'll see if we can balance that by opening the other side. And if we drag our hand a little closer to the pelvis, that will close that side of the chest again. So again, we're going to feel uh, a natural tendency to open up the back side of the chest to compensate the close feeling at the front, in fact, to rectify it. And then finally to roll the hand back out so the palm faces out again. And to mirror that extra opening at the outer edge of the collarbones on both sides of the outer edge of the collarbones. Breathing deep, honest, natural. Wonderful. Release and return to center and catch your breath. Take your legs when you're ready into a generous stride for Upavishta Konasana. <laughs> Using a block is often 
uh, recommended, <coughs> the corner of the block facing forwards. But you don't have to sit on a rock if your back feels light without one. Uh, draw the buttock pressure out and back, or, which often leaning a little forwards to do helps. Toes straight up, chest up, hands cupped, turn them around the other way, roll the shoulder blades down and the chest up and the tummy, I think you'll find naturally wants to sort of have a conversational tone. It's toned, but in a way that I call conversational rather than monologue. So as you feel that tone, it's, it's talking and it's listening, as it were. Talking means it's acting and it sees what its actions do and it responds by further action. Just like an artist, like a painter, she puts a stroke of paint on her canvas, steps back, looks at it, gets a feeling for the next stroke and puts that on, looks at it, and so on until a flow arises in which she disappears. Inhale, lift and turn towards your right leg. Keep the jaw soft, breathe through the nose, thighs relaxed, eyes relaxed. Natural, honest, organic breath. Inhale to lift and turn in the other direction. <coughs> Perhaps we could enjoy contemplating the central channel, the Sushumna, the Madhyanadi, the Avaduta, as many names. And feel into the central channel. So it, you know, it's a channel that we imagine runs anterior to the spinal column and runs all the way up and continues as the spinal column ends. It continues through uh, the cranial cavity. And it just gives ourselves a really beautiful, beautiful organic way to navigate uh, the balance of the pose. So the uprightness, the openness of the central channel means that energy can flow, can fall into it, which represents us not being um, binary about anything at all. You know, if, it, if the experience is not binary, then it's uh, interdependent. We don't separate, you know, good from bad, goodies and baddies. You know, it's just, it's, there's just people, you know, beings with various situations. <laughs> We don't separate, you know, inside from outside, or you from me, and so on. Return to center when you're ready. Bring your legs back together, and if you're on a block, remove the block, <coughs> please. Make sure you're sitting a little forwards on your mat, so you've got mat behind you. Index finger, middle finger, and thumb wrap around uh, the uh, pada angusta. Pada angusta means um, the thumb of the foot in Sanskrit. Big toe, we call it. Lean back if you want and massage the bum in any way that feels that uh, con conditions the breath to open. Um, conditions the breath to open. When we get stuck on a thought, you know, thinking is just a flow. When we get stuck on a thought like a moth around a flame, then the breath also gets stifled. <clears throat> And the Buddha pointed out very, very clearly that the reason there's war or quarrels in the world is because of rigid or dogmatic attachment to views and opinions. He was, he was very, very clear about it in a text called uh, The Thicket of Views. One can begin to extend and play if you want. So views and opinions are a response, you know, a view is... A darshana, in other words, a view is from the root drish to see. <laughs> so our views and opinions should be a, a, an echo or a mirror of what we see, and we see best when we're uh, open. So as you move your legs between straight and bent, or you know both straight or both bent, or together and apart. You're looking for the field to dissolve your biases, our biases, which are simply events that get stuck, they get lodged 
<laughs> like a splinter or something. You know, a stuck event becomes a view. Uh, we oftentimes call that a samskara. And the reason why samskara is equated with another Sanskrit word, vasana, is because vasana meaning perfume. And that samskara pervades our perception in the same way like a perfume can do. It can pervade a room. Okay, coming down, crossing the legs, drawing the buttock push out and back again, breathing easy, jaw soft. Fingertips of your right hand on the floor, left hand comes up. And walk out and over at your own pace, toning the tummy. You can even turn to look up if you want, listening and responding like an artist. Jaw soft, eyes soft. So it's all listening and responding. It's all listening and responding. And a pose is a neutral thing. <laughs> you know, poses can be good for you or bad for you, all depending on whether or not there's listening or responding. Profoundly good for you in the circumstance of listening and responding. Okay, inhale, come up. So there are a lot of critics of uh, different yoga schools. Uh, yin yoga has been criticized. Ashtanga Vinyasa has been criticized. Uh, Iyengar yoga has been criticized. Let's raise the other arm up for damaging the body. Uh, Bikram yoga has been criticized for damaging the body and being founded by someone who's uh, silly in the extreme. <laughs> But the, the point is that the criticism, any pose can go any way. <laughs> because there are plenty of people who practice Iyengar yoga who are in very good shape. So it ain't what you do, but the way that you do it. <laughs> plenty of people who practice Ashtanga Vinyasa are in very good shape, and some who are not. So as we move into this pose, uh, listening, responding which requires emptiness. If you come with a view already, if you come with a decision, this pose should be done like this, uh, that biases our, we can't respond to the way things actually are, which is at least highly variable. Mm -hmm. Okay, arm back down, deep, calm breath. Adho is next, the down face dog which you can come into whenever you're ready. And an emphasis on the side body stretch. So stretching the side ribs through to the hips. Repeatedly coming back to that. To uh, release a samskara, you often have to use a samskara. In other words, as they say in the Tantra, you, if you want to remove a thorn, you have to use a thorn to remove a thorn. So the samskara is focusing on the side ribs, strongly extending back to the hips. Extend the inner armpits back to the groins, the outer armpits back to the hips, the underside of the armpits back to the front groins. The heels travel back as the front thighs travel up. And the inner groins become a sense of space. Give us, we want a sense of space, lift and space. So repetition, listening and responding. These are what condition absorption or samadhi. Shoulders forwards, if there's problems with the wrists, with doing that, you can, of course, be on your forearms, shoulders forwards above the wrists. Although it's worth saying that this often can be very helpful for the wrists if there is a problem there. This is the Kumbhakasana. And so we're hovering now in a diagonal line, bum lower than the shoulder pads. So this is sometimes called the plank. Well, Palankasana is plank. Kumbhaka is a, a, a pot or breath retention. Or I read recently in somebody's uh, final exam, it can also mean marriage between different castes, apparently. I hadn't heard that before. Bringing the knees down to touch the floor lightly. Or, you know, sort of annoyingly lightly. <laughs> like, oh, I wish it wasn't as light as this. And then lift them up again, sorry. 
Love is everywhere. You are love, and I love you. Okay, knees forwards. <laughs> knees forwards and sit up. Uh, kneeling position. Take two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight deep breaths. Of course, you can put blocks between the heels and buttocks in this posture. Breath is expressive and spontaneous and natural. Jaw, soft eyes, soft throat, soft brain, soft. <sighs> Down face dog position again, starting now. <laughs> Take a breath or two. You'll need it. That's a little trailer for the next pose, uh, Vasishtasana. So take the hand that's furthest away from me and step it in the middle space between the two hands. And then turning onto the side of your foot towards me, we come into Vasishtasana. Now, it's quite common that people would want to bring the foot behind you, so they please feel free, or even in front of you, please feel free. And there's a balance. One can do this on the forearm as well, if it's uh, problematic. As, cal as calmly as you can. At least fake it until you can make it. Come back to down face dog. Take a breath or two or three or four. Play out. Play out your down face dog. And then when ready, bring your other hand in the midline of the two hands and move round onto the side of your foot, lining the foot up with the hand. And... If ready, raising your arm up in this exciting, thrilling posture. Vasistasana. Vasista is a, a sage that we find mentioned in many texts. Try and keep it as much as possible a diagonal line. Breathe into it. You can do it on your forearm if, you prefer, if it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Wunderbar. Come back into Adamukha Svanasana if you're ready. Take a very wide stride for this, like really wide. The feet wide, the legs wide, the arms wide, everything wide, as wide as you can go. And then let it all move away from your wrists, up through your arms, away from your elbows, up through to the shoulders, away from the shoulders, through to the hips. Keep moving it in that direction. Away from the wrists, pull it up out of the wrists to the elbows, pull it up out of the elbows to the shoulders, pull it up out of the shoulders to the hips. Good job all. Coming back down to our Vajrasana again. Kneeling position. Three proper deep breaths, expressive, spontaneous, natural. And if four happen, well, that's lovely. Five, great. All the while that we stay in this deep breath, we stay, as it were, in the arms of the goddess. This is what it is to be enlightened. We know that the Buddha said about his teachings, the, the thing that makes them what they are is Paticca Samutpada. What he teaches is conditioned co-production, Paticca Samutpada. Luckily, the sort of similar rhythm when you say it in English and Sanskrit. And it sounds like, what? Well, everything's co-producing everything else. And it's all, you know, it's like everything's causal. This causes that, and that bumps into the other. And it's a sort of uh, beautiful dance of causality which, you know, nothing can be found separate to anything else. You stretch out your legs when you're ready, <laughs> which my prediction is, is about now. And <laughs> bring your hands behind your head, and before you get a chance to think about it, calmly roll back by 60 degrees. Raise your toes by 30, bringing them level with the eyes. Movement is allowed. Trembling is expected. <laughs> Jaw soft. So this is the half boat.
Beautiful. I'm impressed. Bend your knees, hug your legs, go light. So in the lumbar, lighten up the lumbar by moving side to side, hugging the legs. And remember this moment is always original. <laughs> Every moment is always original. <laughs> and so there's, you know, the, the goddess is just dancing and as she dances, you know, you don't know which way her hair is going to go or the silks that wrap around her are going to go. And that's the universe, you know, it's a completely powerful, spontaneous dance. And that's wonderful. So you can't grasp it. <laughs> and neither can you find you know, a self in it. This is the, the Buddha's uh, three lakshanas. And the Buddha said that conditioned existence is marked by being ever changing. Anitya, you know, Anitya means not stable, not still. <laughs> And he says, you can't find an individual, discrete, permanent self in it, an Atman. Mm -hmm. And he said that in all, uh, there's not, nothing permanent in it. You know, you can't find a permanent, lasting, uh, pleasant sensation that just stays pleasant, you know. It's not, he didn't deny pleasure, of course. <clears throat> That's often misunderstood. Some people say, well, you know, well, I really enjoy, you know, this, that, and the other. And you say, of course, you know, <clears throat> me too. There's a great talk by Arjun Samedo called, uh, Does the Buddha Like Ice Cream? <laughs> and the cut to the chase, yes, <laughs> of course he does. Okay, let's release and lay down all our backs. <clears throat> so there's pleasure, but it's not permanent. <clears throat> And sometimes the removal of that pleasure is what we call unhappiness. You know, we had something we really liked and then we don't have it anymore. <clears throat> that's, that's one of the, uh, that's dukkha. So that's it, you know, Buddha says, well, that's part of what, the way things are. It's not a criticism, it's just an observation. An observation that stops us clinging. And magically, when you don't cling, you find out your, your true nature, which is uh, unborn, unconditioned, not male, not female, not young, not old, has no history, not tied down to uh, culture or even species. So when there's this letting go, there's this sort of cross-species communications open up. It's marvelous. Uh, lift up your feet when you're ready and let your lower back uh, Kiss the floor, like the MWAH kind of kiss <laughs> that perhaps someone you really love or give you a kiss on the cheek. That's got the mwah. That's what we want for the back. <laughs> so there's a sort of slightly drawn out um, moment in it for the sake of merging. MWAH kisses uh, feel so good because they cause a um, um, spontaneous merging, which means both parties go beyond conditionality. <laughs> Lift up your head when you're ready and you'll feel your abdominals. And obviously you can move and adjust your hands in any way that uh, works for you, that feels good for you. Open the angle at the back of the knees to 90, 90 degrees, more or less. And then um, turning towards this side of the room, bringing opposite elbow, opposite knee towards each other and then the same the other way and we'll keep that going three on each side six in total the hands don't have to be stuck to the back of the head they can move so that the neck is comfortable at all times and then finally uh, releasing after your six and feet down, deep breath, sigh like exhale. <clears throat> and really, you know, letting that happen. You know, this is the skill of the yogi. Trying to grasp the ungraspable, you exhaust yourself in vain, release the tight fist of grasping and boundless infinity is revealed. That's the skill of the yogi. <sighs> hmm. 
The skill is in giving, the skill is in letting go, the skill is in surrender, sharanagati. Release your hands if you're ready from behind your head. Raise both arms up and wave them side to side. If that's, if that's difficult, I know some people um, get frozen shoulders, not at all uncommon. So if that's difficult, you can bring your arms to wherever, out to the sides, uh, as high up as you can. Or if it isn't difficult, wave them side to side. Or if they can only come down so far, you can use uh, blocks. But the more you move your shoulder blades, the more uh, comfortable and the more integrated this will be. Repetition, Abhyasa, Patanjali recommends it. I think it's 1.16 in the Yoga Sutras. Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tham Niroda. Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam, both of them. Vairagya is not getting caught up, spaciousness. We could call it flow, although the Sanskrit for that is Vahi. Lift your feet, extend the legs to something like 90 degrees, and then let it all hydrate and extraneous tissue melt by movement, wagging your tail, bending your knees, moving your feet, and whatever. Whatever. You don't want to think, you know, it goes beyond thinking. So if you start thinking about it, that's not it. You know, just like we don't want to think about when we're dancing, for example, which is why, you know, when you first start dancing, um, you know, if you're sober, then it takes half an hour or so to sort of, you know, the inhibitions to go and the dance to take over. And then there's just dancing. There's no dancer anymore. There's just dancing. <laughs> so this is the same as that. You know, it's like what we want is the same as we want from dancing. Why people go dancing, you know, because there's like, after a while, they feel like, yeah, yeah, I spent time... Uh, without the self-construct, and I remembered myself. I've heard people talk about going out dancing and call it therapy, yeah. which I which I understand. When you feel uh, integrated and the uh, you know, legs are up and everything's come together a lot more, then you lower the legs down, keeping the lower back close to the floor with the legs relatively straight. The speed of your descent is uh, down to how long we can keep a sense of intimacy with the back and the floor. Intimacy. When you do land, you melt entirely. Breathing deep. Melt entirely. Breathing deep. You let your elbows bend. You let your legs fall away from each other. Jaw, soft eyes, soft throat, soft brain, soft melt in time. Stay in melted, the melted modality and bend your legs. <laughs> Raise up a leg, doesn't matter which one. Dorsi and plantar flex the foot, that's point the toe, push the heel, point the toe, push the heel, point the toe, push the heel, kind of vibe. And you can also circle, half circle until you feel ready to turn the heel in, toes out, crossing that leg over the other. Having done so, my preference is to go beyond the outer ankle just because it feels a little bit stiller, uh, more of this sort of uh, stitihi, as we say sometimes in yoga. Lifting the foot off the floor, foot on the floor, lift your head and plunge one arm through that inverted triangle and interlace around either the back of your thigh or the front of your shin, or you can even use a belt to hold on to. Get the head, bring the head back down, keep the neck long and have some really magic moments there, little portals of richness that can transport you from one universe to another instantly. Oh, so just in the same way that wormholes in space-time could help you uh, travel vast distances theoretically. <clears throat> Similarly here, there are these versions, our own versions of wormholes that can make us disappear from one universe instantly and reappear in another. And those universes are the universe of uh, independence, where things seem independent and separate to the universe of interdependence, to where everything's a dance, where it's impossible to grasp anything as exclusively mine. <clears throat> 
the net result is wisdom and compassion. <clears throat> Okay, if you're if you're ready to release, go ahead. Take two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten deep breaths. Soft eyes, soft brain. Raise up the other leg and similarly, dorsi planter, dorsi planter, circle, half circle. Great for the plantar fascia. Bend, extend, you know, this gets some sort of looseness, loosening. And when you feel ready, the heel in, toes out, cross that leg over the other, lift the foot that's on the floor, off the floor, plunge through the gap, <clears throat> interlace around your far shin, and roll left and roll right and look for sensations <clears throat> that are rich enough. <clears throat> So deep breaths, natural breaths, honest breaths. And looking for those wormholes, those are the rich enough. So if it's not rich enough, find a different sensation that is. And then really melt, let that, that richness sort of eat you. Let that richness eat you. Okay, well done, <laughs> everyone. You can release and roll over. When you're ready to face towards this side of the room and support your head with your hand, if that's problematic for your wrist or, uh, or your neck, you can put a blanket neatly folded on your arm and rest your head on that, which is quite nice, actually, anyway. <laughs> I mustn't get too involved in that while I go all sleepy. <laughs> Lifting up, extend your bottom ribs, really stretch them, extend your armpit. Do those two things a few times so that you increase <clears throat> your contact. Uh, I was a very fortunate child in that we had many ladybird books in our house, which made me very, very happy, <laughs> including one about three little pigs and they were throwing mar and, and a penguin. I can't remember what that was all about now. Do you remember that one? I don't know what was going on. And Rumpelstiltskin, which I think is pronounced differently. Rumpelstiltskin or something. Anyway, I loved that one. He, and he was terrifying, the character in it, wasn't he? Do you remember? And he got quite angry at one point, stomped his foot through the floor. I remember that. And there was an image of him with, uh, he was given lots of hay or straw to turn into gold. Yeah. So that's kind of, and he, he was given a whole room of it one night. He spun that into gold and they went, actually, it's in two rooms. He was very cross about that. <laughs> anyway, it's a long, long explanation for the metaphor uh, that we want increased contact, which is like, seems like worthless, that we then turn into intimacy, we go from contact to intimacy or from touch, you know, from contact to touch, from touch to intimacy. So you're turning a sort of what seems like a worthless raw material into gold. That gold, of course, is absorption. You can see them roll forwards and backwards, increasing the amount of metaphorical straw so that you can spin it into gold. And the gold is absorption in the interdependent field, which everything's part of. It's not like it's over there and you're over here. You know, everything, the whole body itself is an interdependent field, but it's in and it, it is, it is part of a bigger or an infinite interdependent field that in yoga we sometimes call the goddess. Well, I like to emphasize that for multiple reasons. So. Now, you probably like me, once you start moving into the field of the goddess, she's just so benevolent. She draws you to her and she makes you forget yourself. <laughs> in the best sense of the word or expression. 
When you're ready, we start bringing the leg, top leg up and playing with that between the horizontal and vertical planes, massaging agreement into the uh, tissues, the inner thigh tissues, massaging agreement into the inner thigh tissues. So without holding a breath, this is backwards, forwards movement that you can feel the five muscles that constitute the adductors where they feel different, they are different lengths and different thicknesses and different attachments, but they all attach at the pubis, at the lateral margins of the pubic bone. But you can bring them into a sense of together, togetherness, oneness that the mind draws into and the mind becomes absorbed in the goddess and it doesn't cling. It has nothing to cling to. There's no point reading books about how great it is not to cling because then you just cling to not clinging. You know, <laughs> the only way is through the goddess's arms. You know, whether you use that metaphor or not, it's still the same thing. Uh, reaching for your big toe if you're ready, when you're ready. Minimizing the amount you bring your toe to your hand and bringing the hand more to the toe by letting the leg come increasingly close, pushing through any tension by softening it. And then playing, perhaps playing with extension or keeping the leg bent or moving between bent and extended. Breath is your guide, your guru. <clears throat> guru, of course, can mean a teacher. It, can, it literally it translates as heavy, guru. Uh, not as some people have speculated, a division of gu plus ru. <laughs> No, it just not, doesn't exist. Uh, but it's just guru, heavy. <clears throat> and it means, you know, teacher is a heavy weight, you know, they have gravitas. It's like you go to them. So your breath, it really has gravitas, it really knows. Okay, let's bring the leg down if you're ready. And the head down too. And I won't allow myself to lay too long like this because for some reason it always knocks me out. So <laughs> come up nice and easy and back over to the other side of the body for the same, 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 but different. <clears throat> and extending the bottom ribs multiple times. Yeah. Of course, the muscles, the intercostals between the ribs, uh, the three sets of intercostals, benefit tremendously in the, in the intercostal flow. If intercostals can be responsive rather than uh, stuck in the past or in the future, then our breath has good timing. In other words, the muscles all fire off together well, and a well-timed breath is a well-lived life. So let's start to uh, let our breath become uh, well-timed, because a well-timed breath is a well-lived life, means that the breath becomes completely responsive to its environment instantaneously in the same way that a dandelion seed is responsive to its environment, even the very most subtle changes. As you're rolling, look for sensations that are uh, can't be grasped by a word. <clears throat> Sensations that can't be grasped by a word. And that are the goddess. And remember, if you move towards her, she pulls you to her until you're lost in her in a beautiful way. <clears throat> There's a yoga studio in London. And uh, we used to teach there, but it changed its uh, owner and it's changed its name. And, uh, it used to be called Yoga Arch, which was so nice enough. It's because it's in yoga, it's because it's in railway arches. But now it's called Lost in Yoga, which I think is a reference to Lost in Music, the discotheque classic. <laughs> but also, I quite I hope that they're calling it that because that's what we want to be lost in. You know. How you feel about that song? Sorry if I planted it. You don't want it planted. Anyway, bring your top leg up <clears throat> and move between the horizontal and vertical planes enjoyably. As you massage, we know it hydrates the adductor tissues. 
We know it melts extraneous tissue. We know tissue is constantly being formed to support the body. <clears throat> but of course, uh, over time, Homo sapiens have moved into sort of specialist areas. And so some of us end up doing you know, one thing all day long, whether it be, you know, nowadays it's pretty much everyone's doing the same thing all day long, hunching over some sort of screen. But even in the past, you know, you get someone who would be specialist in this or specialist in that. Even apparently Neanderthals had specialists. <clears throat> I know that because I'm enjoying an audible book about Neanderthals, which I love and I highly recommend to you, <clears throat> called Kindred. It's really good. It's read by the author. <laughs> reaching uh, for your big toe, take your time, <clears throat> don't hold the breath, and be you know, beautifully honest, just melting this tissue around the top of the thigh. <clears throat> Once you've taken the big toe, you can experiment if you want <clears throat> with straightening or not, breathing deep, bending, extending, Sometimes movements of the foot can help, but it's all about one thing, and that's surrender to the field. So the breath flows, the eyes are soft, the yogi, she's looking for this return to the mother, you know, she sort of pulls you to her chest, metaphorically speaking, <clears throat> where, you know, your heartbeat becomes hers and vice versa. <clears throat> so that all that one previously clung to as self returns to its source. So in the Tantra, this is called uh, reabsorption. Reabsorption. And it's represented in the Nataraja figure, the dancing Shiva as a, as a flame <clears throat> on one of his hands. Okay, releasing. Coming down. <clears throat> knees up, come up from the side. Now, probably a belt is going to be uh, of utility to you. We're going to <clears throat> fold up mat over, a third of our mat over. And a third of the mat over, which is always more than you think. We might sit on a block, but we might not. Not everyone will need a belt. It depends how long your legs and arms are. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're sitting on a block, uh, which is fine, have the block so that the side closest to me is pulled backwards a little, because we're going to take the foot that's closest to me and pull that backwards. And if you pull the block back, it will let, make space for the foot. Most people will find their foot touches the top of the uh, opposite thigh. One or two people might be able to pull the, the leg back a little further to bring the heel to touch the inner groin of the of its own leg, as it were, of the same leg. Fingertips on the floor belt nearby. Lifting and turning and looking for lightness in the number that's mirrored in the breath and the eyes. Lightness in the number that's mirrored in the breath and the eyes. Letting gravity <clears throat> assist us, so the, the heaviness of the bent leg is inherent to it. So that melts and softens. And after a while, some people might feel a little tilt in the pelvis, right? That the spine might go along with. And at that point, you take the belt and bring it around your foot, unless your pelvis tilts to the point <clears throat> where you can hold your foot, or unless you've got very long arms and very short legs, relatively speaking. <laughs> so if you had very short legs and a very long torso and very long arms, then it's easy to hold the foot. 
but it's quite a specific kind of uh, set of an, an anatomical ratios. Um, what we want to avoid is closing or collapsing. We don't want to collapse the goddess channel, which is the central channel. We can, we can call it the goddess channel. Sometimes it's, it is called that. And we, so that's the, we want to honor, you know, there's, uh, there's a very funny t-shirt that a yoga teacher friend of mine sometimes wears that says, my other body is a temple. And she's, you know, <laughs> this is a joke about his lifestyle. He's um, less of a stereotype yoga teacher than me. <laughs> and uh, he's a very nice guy though, very funny. But of course, my body is a temple. It does come from something in the Sanskrit traditions where we visualize the body as a temple to the goddess and, and we make that temple beautiful in various ways. One thing we do is make sure that the central channel where she lives is spacious and clean. And of course, she represents our merging back to the field which gives us a sense of equanimity. You know, we then don't have this sort of I'm more important than you thing, or you're more important than me thing. You know, everything's equal in the field. If the uh, hamstrings keep releasing and the back knee keeps releasing, of course, one can walk along the belt or uh, further along the leg. It's not important to do so. It's important to keep uh, the goddess channel open and to listen and respond to step out of time, including this sense of trying to get somewhere within a certain time frame, you step out of time. This, of course, is Janu Shia Shasana. And it's in meditation on the goddess. Okay, coming back up calmly the way you went down. <clears throat> and of course, we'll extend out the legs, perhaps a little rub down, <clears throat> a little energy bath, I think is very, very useful. And we always make sure that they are thorough, that they're everywhere, that it's uh, all over a Vyanavayu energy bath, without exception. We don't leave any part of the body un rubbed and, and cleaned by this energy bath. It's a wonderful thing to do. And when you've uh, finished, then you draw your other leg back uh, towards you similarly. So the foot will probably come to the opposite thigh, or in some cases, the leg can draw back a little further and the heel can press into the uh, inner groin of its own leg. Fingertips on the floor, turning the body towards the extended leg and softening. Whatever can be softened is softened. Breath comes and goes, eyes are soft as well. Pelvis tilts and the belt is taken and placed around the foot <clears throat> or a direct hold on the foot in some cases. And we honor the goddess channel. This is our um, bhakti. <clears throat> bhakti comes from rupak, which means to give. <clears throat> So when we talk about bhakti, people often are very into the bhakti traditions because they're simple. You know, the bhakti traditions don't really rely on anything other than devotion. You don't have to study. You don't have to learn yoga techniques. <clears throat> and so they're, you know, they're very good and they're accessible to uh, many. And we find their foundations, of course, in texts like the Bhagavad Gita or the Song to the Lord, as it translates. So we can express our uh, bhakti to the goddess as something that's really like just the wholeness of her, the depth of her that stops the suffering of grasping at a separate, discrete, autonomous 
defended little fortress <laughs> called me, you know, and so you make yourself into a defended little fortress. Um, a, that fortress is easily swept away by the vastness of the goddess on a daily basis. So there's suffering like that. <laughs> and B, it's te inherently tense and fearful. So the goddess relieves you of all of that by taking all that you considered individually mine and returning it to her field. Okay, coming up, slow and easy. Stretch out the legs, an energy bath for every part of the body. Yana Vayu. And when ready, laying down on your back, making sure you're warm, putting on blankets or whatever you need for Savasana. Very important pose, don't skip it. Palms face up. And of course, the pose is entirely about giving. Over the years, I've thought about many marvelous metaphors that are incredible and poetic and amazing, including the NCP metaphor. We won't mention that one now. <laughs> but they're also the metaphor. Uh, it works for me, I hope it works for you, of the uh, person on the bridge with a stone in the hand wanting to drop it into the water to see the splash. But it's seeming to have difficulty. And the passerby, let's say it's you, walks by them and they say, what's up? And this person says, I want to drop a stone into the water. And you say, well, just let it go then. And they say, well... I'm not sure I completely want to commit to it. But, you know, I, can I let go of just a little bit? And you say, no. <laughs> there's letting go or there's holding on, and that's all there is. <laughs> so it's the same here in corpse pose. Letting go is total. <sighs> And however long we stall or prepare to let go, at the end of the day, letting go is, is now. And to the, the delight of the person who lets go of the stone, as the stone drops, the water rises. That rising feeling as the stone drops, it hits the water and the water rises up above the surface. That's the mind becoming light.
feel into the body. Move the toes, move the fingers. Stretch in organic, natural ways. And when you feel ready, bend your legs and there's another opportunity to feel the joy of complete letting go. As you scoot the buttocks under and release the back. Roll onto your side when you're ready, facing away from the shrine. Mm -hmm. And then in your own time, roll back again to face towards the shrine. Let a bit of light and color in. And bring yourself up nice and easy from the side when you feel ready. Facing the shrine with your hands in prayer, <clears throat> if you agree. <clears throat> we can say uh, Tong, which is uh, Tara's Bija Mantra, uh, affirming our agreement with the following words. May any benefit that we've gained in acting in this way this morning go to the alleviation of the suffering of absolutely all beings. Tong. Oh, oh. Oh. Thanks, rumors. Thanks, zoomers. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Lovely to see you all. Just doing a quick scan. Have a really good day and uh, hang loose, dudes. <laughs> see ya. Bye.